Good evening, West Covina, and welcome to our Thursday night Bible study. I'm Pastor Jillian. I'm the youth pastor here, and this is my lead pastor, J.P. O'Connor. Um, before I get into it, I want to give a content warning that tonight's, tonight's study deals with um, sexual violence. So those of you who are, who are triggered by that may wish to skip this episode. Um, I... This is, this is a passage that's so disturbing that its contents aren't even spelled out in the Bible Project videos. Um, and some, some consider it the most disturbing chapter of the Bible. So if that intrigues you, keep listening. If that has you going, no thanks. There is no shame in going, nope, not tonight. Absolutely. So, you know, at your discretion. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you start us off with a word of prayer? Absolutely. Uh, Father in heaven, uh, we need your Holy Spirit tonight. Difficult passage of scripture uh, that has a lot of darkness, and we just pray that your light would shine through, that we would see your purpose, that we would understand uh, more of your will, and that part of it is just understanding how evil and wicked sin is. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, Lord, please be at the center of our talk in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last week we finished up a set of two chapters that kind of dealt with Micah and his idols and the war that followed. We're embarking tonight on a section of three chapters. The next two chapters aren't great, I, aren't great in terms of being bright, cheerful, and happy either, but this is definitely the darkest. Mm -hmm. um, as we're filming this, it's the day before Halloween, and it almost feels like we're recording the <laughs> Halloween episode here. This timing is uh, quite interesting. It is really interesting, because we were supposed to film it like a week ago, mm -hmm. two weeks ago, but it seems weirdly fitting. Um, and it came to pass in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. So let me, let me pause it for a moment at when there was no king in Israel. This is hearkening back to um, the thesis statement of the book that comes back several times, which is, yeah. in those days, there was no king and everyone did as they saw fit. Mm -hmm. So this is a story that's all about relativism and lack of authority and just, you know, chaos. It's about what happens without the light that God's law provides. Mm -hmm. So this Levite, he took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Let's also stop for a moment there, because we already have something that's very morally gray. We have this Levite who's taking on a concubine. Because of what happens later on in the story, I've heard some people say that the first time they read through the Bible, they were like, a concubine can't be a person, right? A concubine, the way I've told it to, to my middle school students who've asked me when the words shown up in other passages, um, was a second-class wife or more like a mistress, you know, someone who mm -hmm. was bound to the guy but didn't have all of the rights and status of an official mm -hmm. wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is already a strange arrangement for a Levite, a teacher, you know, one of God's spiritual, leader. spiritual leaders to have. You would consider it a little weird if one of your pastors openly had a mistress, right? That would be weird. It would be kind of like, uh, we're living together and we're not married. Yeah, um, yeah. Kind of like that. It's a, it's a fairly common arrangement out in the world, but it would, be, it would raise eyebrows for a pastor, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, verse 2. But his concubine played the harlot against him and went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah and was there four whole months. She got sick of him, either you know, she cheated on him, something Marital like problems. that. Yeah, and she went back to her father's house. She wanted to get away from him, one way or another. So, you know, do you think, uh, I'm not asking you to answer, it's just mm -hmm. a question about the text itself, but um, d is it implying that she actually cheated on him or him or her going away to her father's house was playing the harlot? Uh, it's do, do hard you know to I mean? tell, and I've seen like three different readings of this mm -hmm. verse. I, I looked into it deeply in college, because why not? Um, one is what I just said, which is she cheated on him. Okay. A very idiosyncratic reading that I worked into a short story that I wrote on this passage um, is that instead of playing the harlot against him, he was using her as a money-making source, hmm. and she ran away to her father's house as okay. a result of that abuse. Um, 
That reading is intriguing from a character perspective, but linguistically feels a little less likely. Right. It is intriguing, though. I would, If she's in heaven, I really want to ask her what actually happened here. Sure. Um, and the third reading is that by going to her father's house, by leaving him, she's playing the harlot, as okay. it were. Because she's like... Being unfaithful. Yeah, being yeah. unfaithful by leaving him. Um, and what, what's interesting is that you catch you catch some wives being accused of being bad women or bad spouses when they leave their husbands for abuse even today. Yeah. And it's something it's something to watch out for not to blame the victim in some of these situations. I'm not saying she's the victim because a possible reading of this is that absolutely everyone in this story is pretty bad in mm -hmm. some way or another. Mm -hmm. um, that there's there's cascadingly increasing levels of evil with her being the least but still not being, you know, a perfect person either. Yeah. Um, so she was there for four whole months. Verse three. Then her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back, having his servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him, and he stayed with him three days, and so they ate and drank and lodged there. Then it came to pass on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning, and he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. The, the girl's father is very anxious to see that the that the relationship be patched up. Mm -hmm. We don't know if it's for a financial reason, um, because, you know, girls, you had to take care of them yeah, and right. all of that. Mm -hmm. um, or if it was for the reputation involved, the reputations involved. Um, but verse six, so they sat down and the two of them ate and drank together. Then the young woman's father said to the man, Please be content to stay all night and let your heart be merry. And when the man stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him, so he lodged there again. Then he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart. It is five days, okay? But the young woman's father said, Please refresh your heart. So they delayed until afternoon, and both of them ate. And when the man stood to depart, how many days is this now? It's the fifth day, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. He and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day is now drawing toward evening. Please spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go your way early so that you may get home. Mm. So, looks like you have something to say about this. I just feel like it's suspicious. The whole thing just feels off to me. Um, it's it goes beyond hospitality. It feels like a delay tactic. I can't get the motive out of the story, so Here's, I don't know why necessarily. I've already put a content warning at the top of this. I was hesitant to share this because I thought it might be a little too much for a YouTube Bible study. But I think that the girl's father is trying to arrange for them to conceive a child while she's there to mm -hmm. keep them together. Okay. Um, that when he says, "Be merry." He's trying to get things to happen there to cement the relationship further. He wants to send them on their way um, with as little possible of breaking up as as, as can be. Okay. I, I mean, I, I don't mind that. I think it's probably a, a wise option. But I feel like the husband has traveled from his home mm -hmm. to this house. He yeah. has spoken kind words to her. Yeah. So he wants to reconcile. Mm -hmm. And he plans on bringing her home to take care of her and I feel like he has a, you know a plan to make things right I don't know why the father then would feel the need to overdo it unless he knows the history unless he knows that there was abuse mm -hmm. uh, which that, that leads to a second reading that just occurred to me which mm -hmm. is the father is trying to delay this because he knows that this Levite hasn't treated her well because she's been there for four months and told her side of the story mm -hmm. whatever her side of the story is and um, he's trying to stall the Levite from going, from taking her back with him and possibly mistreating her some more. And he's feeling like a protective father. It feels off, that's all. Right, the, the right. Whole interaction doesn't feel safe or normal, which means something is There's tension, is off. there's anxiety mm -hmm. in, in, in this. And yes. either way, there's anxiety. 
I mean, you're you're a father of daughters. I am. Um, and if you knew that a guy was mistreating one of them, yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't live very long. <laughs> no. I'm no. saying that in the you know earthly fatherly way. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not yeah. Killing yeah. Anybody, but yeah. you know, I just no, it's not going to go well. That's my little girl. Yeah, yeah. However. Verse 10. The man was not willing to spend that night. He's impatient. He's done. We've been here for five days. Now, okay, when I was when I was younger reading the story, I was like, I actually kind of get it because when I visit some relatives, you plan to set out a certain time that day, and it's like six hours later, like, okay, guys, I really need to go. I got work in the morning. Bye. Um, because like, another round of cards. Oh, have a meal. All this, and it's all so lovely. It's just loving Stay you to death, and they know night. they know it will. They 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 know they won't see you again for a while because it takes however long to get out to where they live, and you love them and you're enjoying it. And you're just like, bye. I have work to do in the morning. Um, <laughs> it's not easy, and you feel cold doing it, especially yeah. if they look at you like, when will I see you again? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, in this last one, the father adds a new detail in saying, tomorrow go your way so that you may get home, with the implication, get home in one day. Um, he's giving practical advice, not just, mm -hmm. hey, stay because it's all cushy and nice here and have a good time. Mm -hmm. No, he's actually giving something practical there. Don't travel at night. Don't travel at night, you morons. <laughs> um However, the man was not willing to spend that night. He's afraid he's going to get sucked in and never be able to leave. So he rose and departed and came opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. So get this. Um, they're near one of the strongholds of the Jebusites. With him were the two saddled donkeys. His concubine was also with him. They were near Jebus, and the day was far spent. And the servant said to his master, Come, please, and let us turn aside into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. You know, well-established city. You know, it was a sacred to the Jebusites. It was their capital. Um, David wouldn't take it until way, way longer from then. But his master said to him, We will not turn aside here into a city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeah. So he said to his servant, Come, let us spend, draw near to one of these places and spend the night in Gibeah or Ramah. And they passed by and went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They turned aside there to go into Logic Gibeah, and when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take them into his house to spend the night. Mm -hmm. So this is, he had the opportunity to spend the night with foreigners, but thought he would be treated better with his fellow Israelites. But he gets to the square, and no one would take them for the night. So already there's this breakdown of hospitality yes. here. Um, the whole, sorry. It's not more. strange for people to stay in the open square. The city no. center was a place where anybody could go and it was safe. Mm -hmm. You're inside the center of a city. You can lay your sleeping bag down on the ground and stay there. Um, you know, it'd be like uh, in a lot of cities we have a park or whatever, but it yeah. was very common. And we see it in many of these stories where the town center is mentioned as, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, uh, the story of Lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And the angels who visited, they said, no, we're not going to stay with you. We're just going to sleep in the city center. We're going to, no. And Lot's like, no. Yeah. You, you know, you coming into my house. <clears throat> so it, I guess what I'm trying to say is that <clears throat> it's not like it's some strange thing or bad thing. It just, there wasn't enough hospitality for them to go inside of a house or get a bed or an inn. But they're going to sleep in the normal place where people slept, the poor people. There's something there's something weird and off about it though because he is a Levite and they were generally treated with extra respect. Um, just then, an old man came in from his work in the field at evening, who was also from the mountains of Ephraim. He was staying in Gibeah, whereas the men of the place were Benjamites. And when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler in the open square of the city. And the old man said, "Where are you going? And where do you come from?" 
So he said to him, We are passing from Bethlehem in Judah toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I'm from there. I went to Bethlehem in Judah, now I'm going to the house of the Lord. But there is no one who will take me into his house, although we have both straw and fodder for our donkeys, and bread and wine for myself, for your female servant, and for the young man who is with your servant. There is no lack of anything. He's basically saying no one will give us shelter for the night, even though we have all the stuff we need, and we wouldn't be a drag on anyone's household. And the old man said, Peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only do not spend the night in the open square. So he brought him into his house and gave fodder to the donkeys, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. So, okay, there's a lot of parallels here between the story of um, Lot mm -hmm. and the angels. Um, in this case, though, Instead of it being a pagan city, it is one of Israel's cities. Mm -hmm. And instead of it being an angel, it's a Levite. And instead of it being Lot, it's this old Ephraimite. And these parallels are very interesting because while there's deliverance for Lot, there isn't deliverance later on here. Mm -hmm. Verse 22, as they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain, go for it. I, I'm going to interrupt you. Go. I'm sorry. Go, go there was it. a statement back in verse 19, that uh, 18, uh, that I found interesting, and I don't know why it's there. And I'm, I'm going to the house of the Lord? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. the house of the Lord isn't in the mountains of Ephraim. No. Um, it's at Shiloh, which is in the south. He's headed north. It doesn't even make sense. He's going in the wrong direction. Um, we saw in Micah, uh, you know, in the stories, the previous stories, that some people were setting up. Mm -hmm. homes with idols and altars in their houses mm -hmm. is it possible that this i mean we already find it strange that this levite is in the mountains of ephraim right mm -hmm. we've discussed that already mm -hmm. is it possible that he's calling his home the house of the lord and that's where Ooh. he's going D -d -d if so sense, that's right? really messed up it is, it is messed up I, i'm not sure yeah I, i'm not sure but the statement caught me and i've read this story a bunch of times but i don't remember reading mm -hmm. that specific sentence so I guess mm -hmm. I'm just drawing attention to it because yeah. I'm not sure what it means. It's interesting. Mm -hmm. 22, sorry about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As they were enjoying themselves, suddenly certain men of the city, perverted men, surrounded the house and beat on the door. They spoke to the master of the house, the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came to your house that we may know him carnally. That's rude. That's very, very rude. Same words, by the way, that we see in Used uh, against Lot's the angels. story. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Which, yeah. you know, says that this city of Gibeah uh, is equal and evil that of Sodom. Mm -hmm. So there's a connection that the Bible's trying to make for us to show that God's people at this time... Are just as bad as the pagans as in Lot's pagans time. time. And that, that should serve as a warning to us, too. Sometimes we spend a lot of time going tisk 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 at the news or whatever. Mm -hmm. and, oh, how evil the world is. But sometimes we're just as bad. Mm -hmm. um, this whole story doesn't happen in the pagan lands. It happens in Israel. Yes. Verse 23. But the man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brethren, I beg you, do not act so wickedly. Seeing this man has come into my house, do not commit this outrage. So, so far, he's starting to sound like the hero of the piece. Here's someone with a moral compass. Look, here is my virgin daughter and the man's concubine. Let me bring them out now. Humble them and do with them as you please, but to this man do not do such a vile thing. So basically, the thinking here is... Um, it's fine to it's fine to rape and abuse a female stranger but not a male stranger and even his own daughter this is this is yeah this is a clear bald-faced devaluation of the female gender mm -hmm. because if you look at it just about everything else about the levite and his concubine is more or less the same. She married a Levite, which makes her, you know, by marriage, a, 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 a you know, from the tribe of Levi. Mm -hmm. They're both strangers, but he sees no problem with offering her up um, when the man is the one who's attacked. 
and a lot of times in Lot's story and in this story, you hear the argument yeah. that they were, you know, the the law of having a guest in your home was higher than anything else. But the woman was the guest equal to the man. They're both guests, but he is willing to throw her out to the crowd and not the man. Yeah. So, you know, there's definitely uh, it's not the law of the guest that is at work here. No. Um, and there's a key phrase in the second part of verse 24 where it says, humble them yeah. and do with them as you please. This isn't about this isn't about um, lust for pleasure. This is about domination. Both this story and the story of Lot aren't actually stories about homosexuality per se that's a separate discussion um a worthy discussion to have not on camera um but what this particular passage and the story of lot are both talking about is an aggressive violent sexuality that is about using what was meant to be a mutually enjoyable gift of god to build a relationship in order to humiliate someone it's about taking what God made sacred and beautiful at Eden and turning it into an ugly tool of Satan. Yeah. Uh, my, my note below, and this is the Andrew Study Bible, so mm -hmm. the notes are not God's words. Uh, but mm -hmm. it does you know, show some light that uh, they, they make the note that's humble them here uh, is the Hebrew word uh, for rape. Yeah. So I think that, you know, maybe the Bible writers were trying to avoid using the language that would be mm. most offensive. Or the translators trying, were trying to, to avoid it. That's what it. I mean. Yeah. They're trying to avoid, but the, the word, he basically says, go ahead and rape them. You know, he raped them, abused them all night until morning, and then, you know, uh, in the morning, let them, go, let them go so that they can go home. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's, a, that's an interesting side note that the Bible's actual language in its original is very earthy. There's even things that we would consider street language or even profanity sure. in, in some of the original Hebrew of some books. Um, in the book of Ezekiel in particular, there's a lot of street slang and, and, and you know things that even sound like profanity in there. Um, and because this is a sacred book and people read it in church and people have notions of what polite... Um, what what polite stuff in church is supposed to sound like, they gentled up quite a few things when they translated Absolutely. it. And I have mixed feelings about that because we do have children in our congregations and um, we do have, we are doing public worship. The Bible itself is so raw though, speaking from this, this dark and sometimes crude part of reality that includes... Things like verse 25, but the men would not heed him. The man took his concubine and brought her out to them. And they knew her and abused her all night until morning. And when the day began to break, they let her go. By the way, where's the daughter? She's not in the narrative anymore. She's not in the narrative. I was not noticing that. Uh, which means that maybe they just took the concubine instead of the daughter and the concubine. Because it doesn't mention. Yeah. In stories this dark, and I just want to pause here. Um... I want to pause here, instead of glossing it over quickly, the experience of the concubine during all of this. She's not named in this story. Um, she has no power, no agency in this story. Even, she doesn't say a single line of dialogue in this whole story. She has no voice. Um, even when it's, even when her, her husband and master, um, comes back for her, all the conversations are between her father and him. But the Bible doesn't shy away from describing her situation, and sacred record doesn't leave this out, because even in the darkness of abusive situations that happen to people with no voice, God is there. Things that happen, evil things that happen to people in private do not go unnoticed and unrecorded by God. Um, yeah. And I don't know if there's anyone out there who needs to know that. Mm -hmm. um, that if something happened to you, God was there too. Not approving of what was going on. The question is, why would God let such a thing happen? Because, unfortunately, 
The strange gift of choice allows for evil as well as good. But he was there the whole time. He felt the pain even more than the person going through it. Mm. Um, and he will not let that go unaddressed. Verse 26. Then the woman came as the day was dawning and fell down at the door of the man's house where her master was till it was light. Okay, so on my part, it bothers me because I want to know where the husband was. Right? Did he just go to sleep? Did he sleep okay that night? Um, you know, was he comfortable? Did he have a bed? Uh, did he have a nice meal? Um, it just bugs me. Yeah. How can he just let... Maybe it's because she's his concubine, not his wife. Maybe they've had problems. Maybe he's just letting it happen. But there's something seriously wrong with this guy. Uh, yes. This husband. Uh, just so wrong. I mean, what was done to her is wrong. But this guy's attitude towards it is wrong. Even even at this moment that she's crawling up to the house. Why isn't he looking for her first thing in the morning? Why does she have to... Why isn't crawl? he nervously pacing it and periodically yes. opening, the, opening the door, you know? Something. Anything. There's just this... Uh, yeah. This lack of... Uh, emotion uh, of sick. compassion compassion just yeah. sick Ugh. yeah so verse 27 and and it's interesting how they translated it you know a little differently here I think earlier they referred to him as her husband mm -hmm. but now it says when her master when her master arose in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way there was his concubine fallen at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold so her hands on the threshold like that is a plea for justice. It's a way of saying, please do something about this. It's, it's saying, mm. don't let this go unaddressed. Mm. But he doesn't catch on to it. And he said to her, get up and let us be going. In the Hebrew, the way that's written makes it sound like the steps of a donkey, as though he doesn't regard her as any more important than his beasts of burden. But there was no answer. So the man lifted her onto the donkey, and the man got up and went to his place. So there's something key I want to mention here, that... It never explicitly says that she's dead and leaves that an open mystery box. Either way, what comes next is disturbing. It's all the more disturbing if she's not quite dead. Verse 29, when he entered his house, he took a knife, laid hold of his concubine, and divided her into 12 pieces, limb by limb, and sent her throughout all the territory of Israel. And so it was that all who saw it said, no such deed has been done or seen from the day that the children of Israel came up from the land of Egypt until this day. Consider it, confer, and speak up. He's trying to send a message about what happened, but something I see in here is that he is exact he is not exaggerating the horror of what happened but what he things that happen in the next chapter tell me that this is more about his the way the way what happened to her reflects on his honor than it is about her justice hmm. um the right way to go about this would have been to actually go address these specific men who did it yeah um but if, if, if I'm not careful here, I'm going to end up in your territory. But the point, the point I want to make here is that um, in the middle of this really dark and, let's face it, horrific story, um, God is still there. We don't see his name mentioned anywhere here. He does not endorse the actions of anyone in here. No one's listening to him in this story. But he's still present, and it is still recorded. Not everything horrible that's ever happened to anyone has been recorded mm. in the Bible, but it's recorded 
in heaven. It's yes. recorded in God's heart. And it will be addressed. And it will be addressed more fairly and more justly than the absolutely insane situation that really gets out of hand in the next chapter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it will be addressed. I'd like to think that perhaps we'll meet this woman someday in eternity. Perhaps. And she'll finally know, she'll finally know a master in the form of Jesus who is kind, who is Amen. merciful, and who is worthwhile, who will treat her as valuable, who will call her by name. But until that happens, I feel like this passage was written with a touch of horror to it on purpose so that we would not gloss over these things mm -hmm. so that we would actually go consider it, confer and speak up and consider those who have been abused and be a voice for them. Mm -hmm. Every woman has a story. Not every woman has a story about rape per se, but every woman has a story about where her voice hasn't been heard. Every woman has a story about things that have been done to her inappropriately, where her physical personhood has not been respected as her own. Every woman has a story, and sometimes, sometimes it seems like no one, no one cares about those stories, you know? Yeah. Um, but there is a God in heaven who sees all these things as they are happening, who cares about them and will bring justice. Mm -hmm. For all these things that have happened. Until then, we stand up and we speak up for each mm -hmm. other. Let's pray. Lord, you are a God of mercy and justice. You are not like this Levite who leaves us to the pain and abuse of the world. You are the God Almighty and compassionate who sees and hears and will see justice done. Lord, I pray for anyone listening to this who is dealing with trauma and who needs a touch of your healing. I pray that you will give them courage, but that you will also give them joy. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much that you do not shy away from the darkness in this story in recording it for the ages so that we know that you do not approve of these things. In Jesus' name. Amen.